Danny Kane is the author of the Poetry Collections Continental Breakfast and El Dorado Freddy's, as well as the chapbook Uncle Harold's Maxwell House Haggadah. His poetry has appeared in Diagram, Hobart, Barrel House, and Mid-American Review, among other places. He lives in Lawrence, Kansas, where he owns Raven Bookstore. And if you're not following Raven on social media, you should be because they're always up to great things, such as what we're here to talk about today. Um, Danny's new book, How to Resist Amazon and Why, was just released from Microcosm Publishing. It's been getting great reviews from all over. Um, so we're going to be doing sort of a um, question and answer here with Danny. I'll, I've got some questions to ask him about his book. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat there, and we'll kind of pass those off as well. So uh, officially, thanks for coming to Canada, Danny. Of course. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm, I'm really happy to do this. And thank you for the support. Absolutely, man. I'm really happy that it's come out. Uh, I've been eager for this for a while. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you first. So like, how long have you been a bookseller and what brought you to becoming the owner of the Raven Bookstore? Sure. Yeah, I never, I was going to be a teacher. I was supposed to be uh, a high school teacher for my, my whole career. And that's what I went to school for. And I graduated undergrad and went right into a, a job teaching sophomore English in a uh, very tiny rural high school in, in small town, Ohio, which proved to be a, a bad fit in many ways um, <laughs> through no fault of the wonderful students. But it just, um, as much as I had thought I had the temperament of a teacher, I realized I, I kind of didn't. And so I, I stopped doing that. And then, well, my first thought was maybe teaching college is better. So I went back to grad school and did um, teaching freshman comp to kind of pay my way through a couple master's degrees. And um, I like the, the English stuff. Uh, the masters were in English and, and poetry. I like that stuff, but teaching really didn't didn't take off. So I, I moved from Ohio to Lawrence, Kansas to get an MFA in poetry here at the University of Kansas. Um, and I got a part-time job at the Raven um, and fell in love with independent book selling and every part of the business. It's just, this is a, it was a magical place. The store has been here for 35 years uh, since 1987. Um, it's well beloved in the communities, uh, in the community it serves. Um, it's filled with wonderful people and wonderful books, um, wonderful animals. We have two store pets and it just became a place I wanted to spend, you know, my, my working life uh, taking care of really. And so um, I got more and more involved as I progressed in grad school and then um, the, the owner, it was actually, uh, we were just talking about the, the nervous moments before a, a book event when you're, you're tinkering and, and moving chairs around to deal with your nervous an anxiety and energy. Uh, it was one of those points. I was with my boss, the former owner, and, and as a joke, she was just like, maybe I'll just sell you the store. And like, I didn't know if she was joking or not, but I was like, listen, uh, ha ha, number one. Number two, if you ever actually want to have this discussion, I'd be happy to figure out if there's a way we can work it out. Um, and then about a year later, uh, we did. And I graduated in May and took over in August of 2017. Um, so I, I'm, I'm proud and humbled to be a steward of this great place. I love your kind of long route to book selling. I have one too, where I was going to be a jazz musician and went to school for, for guitar and was going to do that. But then an arm injury took me out. Oh no! I, I don't do it anymore. So I got a job where I was shelling books with one hand for a long time, <laughs> and then that's what started it all. And and now hosting Zoom events on here. Yeah, well, I mean, like book selling can be a really physical job too. So I'm glad the 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 injury still allowed that. Um, but you're doing great. I'm glad. I'm glad it worked out this way. Well, thank you. Um, so in the book, you mentioned that Amazon affects literally every aspect of your running a bookstore. And a lot of people probably think, oh, well, it's just a pricing thing. Like you can get stuff cheaper online than in a store. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you meant, how it literally affects every bit of what you do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the pricing thing is important. Um, and it's, I think it's a good place to start thinking about Amazon's effect on, on bookstores and other industries. And so we can't, it's not really practical or possible for us to operate a business like King's Co-op or The Raven to operate uh, on the prices that Amazon sells books for. Their, their margins, they can do that because they make a lot of, they have a lot of different revenue streams. And we got into books because we love books and that's all we want to do. And we should, that should be possible to, um, if, if there's a, a market and a community uh, that wants to support the bookstore, it should be possible to make a living just selling books. Um, but 
um, it would be, we would be out of business very quickly if um, we tried to sell books at those prices. So that's on, on one thing, we're dealing with that. On the other hand, the, the customers come in here knowing full well that all of this stuff is available cheaper elsewhere. Um, and especially these days when we're doing so much business through the mail and shipping, um, the shipping is also faster and cheaper elsewhere. So part of what we do, we, that, that kind of argument about why you're still supporting us despite these things is, is built into how we talk about what we do and, and what we do. Um, so in that way, it really kind of affects our, our philosophy of business. Like we, we have to sell books at the price the publisher sets. Um, and, and I'll say here that it's, I'm not trying to imply that bookstores are artificially inflating the, the price of books. We're charging the price that of the books. Amazon is the one that's tinkering with books and they're tinkering in a way that devalues the book in general. It devalues the book as an object. It devalues the work that goes into creating the book. It goes into the, it devalues the authors. When you, when you engage in this massive decades long effort to artificially deflate the price of books, um, you're telling everybody that books should be worth less. Uh, and so that's an industry wide impact. And that's kind of what I mean by they affect everything we do. So that's just in terms of books and, and pricing. Um, but I mean, they, Amazon affects the, the landscape. Um, they're, they're kind of, um, they're depressing uh, downtown main streets. Like we're on kind of a main drag that's set up like a kind of an old school, small town that, that's lined with small businesses. Um, and in places like this and elsewhere, empty storefronts are kind of springing up in between these small businesses as people can't make it. And, and a lot of that has to do with Amazon's expanding into many, many different industries. But even to the fact that like it's stupid little things, like when we've got two parking spots reserved for uh, curbside pickup and one of those, those big, ugly prime vans just decides <laughs> to park there for an hour as they make their deliveries, like that's the way Amazon is impacting our business. Um, so it's, it's just a lot of little things. Um, and yeah, I, I, the, the one more thing I'll add to that is that Amazon kind of wants to take over <laughs> their customers' lives. Their, their motto is customer obsession. Um, not that they're obsessed with customers, but they want their customers to be obsessed with them. Uh, and they, they want customers to rely on Amazon for everything from their books, to their food, to their streaming entertainment, to their home security. Um, you know, that's the idea is Amazon wants to extend its tentacles into every aspect of life. So what started you, you know, you've got this problem, you're, you're going out of your way to kind of fight with Amazon, you're being proactive about it, which I love. Mm -hmm. What is the story of like, how did you start writing? Like you said, you're a poet, you wrote poetry books. How did you go from <laughs> writing poetry to writing a nonfiction book against like the biggest company in the world? <laughs> That's a great question. I still write poetry books. Uh, uh, and I think I identify primarily as a poet and that's converting that to nonfiction has been a unique set of challenges. Although um, all that, all those years in grad school kind of helped. Like I know how to cite a source and put together an argument. Uh, so I'm kind of, I was set up despite my energies being focused on poetry. I was set up to be able to put together a, a lengthy nonfiction argument. Um, part of it is just the magic of the Raven. Um, so the, these like small guy versus big corporate competition um, discussions are not new in the, in the book world. Um, and they, they reached a first fever pitch in the 90s um, with the expansion of, of two big uh, players, one being Walmart and one being um, the bookstore mega chains. In the US, it was Borders and Barnes and Noble. Um, and uh, that was the first time we had to have those arguments and, and to, to build that, that uh, philosophy that we, we still practice today about why people are supporting us, even though it might cost more money. And The Raven um, opened in 1987. In 1997, a Borders Books and Music Superstore opened directly across the street from us. And like we were literally in the shadow of, of a giant corporate bookstore with uh, a, you know, a, a million books, um, many of which were 30% off um, and they were right there. And so the Raven had to figure out how to make that argument pretty quick. And they did. And one of the original owners, her name is Pat Katie, got very good at, at talking to the press, um, at, at telling the Raven's story and kind of selling the idea and the importance of small businesses to their customers. If Twitter had been around in 1997, Pat would have been all over it, just mm -hmm. like I am today. She would have been out there on there saying the same stuff. Um, 
and that borders was there until 2011 when the the chain um, shut down um, so in a way i'm just kind of continuing the work and you get indoctrinated when you work at the raven and it's just it, in in book selling it's part of what you do is you internalize the philosophy and I was really inspired by the Raven's legacy of standing up um, and speaking out for the importance of small businesses and, and community oriented businesses. Uh, and so I just adapted that argument. You know, there's a little bit less talking to newspapers, a lot more uh, talking to customers directly online. But in many ways, I'm just continuing the work that the Raven has been doing for decades. Uh, and then, so if you want then, so how did the book itself happen? That's the kind of philosophical answer. The answer of the book is um, that social media stuff began to strike a nerve. Um, we went viral for a Twitter thread that kind of outlined our arguments against Amazon um, and explained uh, the importance of what we do. That got written up in the Chicago Tribune. And like, uh, I remember walking home from work and the bookseller called uh, my cell and was like someone from the Chicago Tribune wants to talk to you and that was kind of a moment where I realized that people were listening to what the Raven had to say it was a big moment um, and so I began to really think about the best ways to handle this and and it's important to me not to waste the platform like if people are going to be paying attention to the Raven I want to make sure we're we're working for something good and something we value uh, so I began to think about um, what we were arguing and how we were doing it um, what exactly I was arguing for. Um, and so I wrote a kind of manifesto in the form of a letter to Jeff Bezos. It's in the book. It opens the book. Um, but I posted that online. And a friend of mine who runs a bookstore in Cleveland, Ohio, um, called me up and said, uh, if you made this into a broadside or a zine, um, we would love to sell it to our customers. And that, that attracted me for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, I love zines. Um, I love the form. And when I was in grad school for poetry, I would make zines every time I went to a poetry reading just to sell at the book table in the back. Um, get my po it's, It takes forever to publish a poetry book. It took me seven years in between the first poem and holding my first poetry book. Um, and, you know, it, you want to see your name in print. It's fun to, to have an object you made. And so I just learned how to make zines. And with all that practice, I could put together a zine very quickly. And then I also really like my friend's advice because this is the discussion we're having right now. I had been having um, among other booksellers for my entire bookselling career. Um, mm -hmm. We love to do it at conferences, in Facebook groups. We're really good at telling the story to each other, but it's not gonna go anywhere unless we, we bring it to our communities as well and kind of cross the cash register with this conversation. And that's why the idea of having a zine was really attractive to me. So I just took an afternoon, took screenshots of all the social media stuff, put the letter in the zine, wrote a couple extra things, um, some book recommendations, some sources for further reading, um, and and like went to down the street to Kinko's and I don't know, made 50 or 100 of them. And they were gone within hours. Um, and bookstores, other bookstores caught wind and started placing orders. And all of a sudden we were selling these zines and wholesaling these zines to other stores. Um, and it was getting really overwhelming. My entire life was stapling zines for a couple of weeks in October 2019, which is cool and romantic. But like, I, you know, I'm a dad. I have other stuff to do. Uh, so um, Microcosm Publishing out of Portland, who I had already been paying attention to because they're super cool, reached out and offered to put out their own version of the zine. And I like Microcosm because they're one of the few publishers of their size that refuses to do any business with Amazon. And so... Most publishers say like, my hands are tied. This is half of my book sales. They suck, but there's nothing I can do about it. But Microcosm was like, I don't know, let's see. Like, what the hell? Why don't we try to divest from Amazon and see what happens? Cause we just can't deal with, with these people. Um, so they pulled their Amazon accounts and started doing their own distribution and opened a warehouse in Portland and their sales went up. Um, and they're having boom times in part because people are attracted to them because of the stand they took. And so they were a perfect fit for the zine um, that was in, in late October of 2019, they put out their version of the zine. By Christmas time, the zine was selling strong enough that their, the, their publisher, uh, Joe Beal, sent me an email that was like, hey, this can really be a book if you want it to be. People are interested in this enough. Do you want to expand it um, into a paperback? And I said, sure. And so I spent all of last year um, putting it together uh, and kind of refining the argument and, and reshaping um and and polishing and bringing in new sources and so then here it is came out two weeks ago 
I'm so glad you wrote it too, because I had the zine in our store and I just wanted more. I wanted more information. I wanted it all there because it's, if you start talking to someone about why Amazon is terrible, like I don't have all day, mm -hmm. you know, for every person that comes in the store. So it's nice to have like a compendium <laughs> almost of like yeah. of everything that's kind of been going on. Uh, my only complaint is that it, it ends because like even the past two weeks since I've had your book, a bunch of other news stories about like how terrible they are. It keeps, they keep coming out. That was a really, that was actually one of the challenges of putting the book together is where to stop. Um, and I was trying to stay as current as possible. There were a couple books in there I cited as advanced copies because um, I was working with them before the books even came out. And then, um, you know, part of me wishes I could keep going. I'm glad the book came out now. I think March 2021 is a really interesting month for Amazon. Um, I would have loved to write about the current unionizing drive in Bessemer, yeah. Alabama. Um, there were whispers of it, and I mentioned unions in the book, but the, um, these, these workers, um, in, in, in the face of steep odds and severe union busting efforts, are actually holding a union election. And if if uh, an Amazon warehouse unionizes, that's really going to change the story of Amazon labor in a really necessary way. Um, so, uh, like the, the story is ongoing. Um, the question of where to stop. Um, when I finished this book, I didn't know how the the U.S. presidential election was going to turn out. I had no right. idea, but we had a deadline if we wanted to get it out in March. And again, I'm glad it came out now because a lot of people are talking about this stuff. But what I did is um, the the antitrust subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee issued a big report um, in late 2020. Um, and you might remember they had a kind of a blockbuster hearing where all, all four big tech CEOs appeared and testified and kind of bumbled their way through their testimony. Yeah. Um, the, their report, the report that committee issued uh, is a landmark report and it's a, a clear eyed bipartisan blueprint for legislative action to control Amazon. And one of the focuses in the book that's not in the zine is legislative and policy based. Because um, I don't want to make this seem like consumer choices are going to defeat Amazon because they won't. And I don't think it's up to the consumers. I can't blame consumers for for choosing convenience or low price. I'm not my interest is not shaming anybody for where they shop. It's not that kind of project. The main question we need to be asking is why was Amazon allowed to get away with this stuff? And that's not a consumer question, that's a government question. And so uh, that being kind of the, the promise of, of future government action felt like a natural kind of stopping point for where I could end and actually turn in the book manuscript. Perfect. How do you go about talking to people like on a daily basis about Amazon, because you mentioned like Amazon wants that loyalty. They want to take care of everything mm -hmm. for you. So you talk about it to some people and they have this guttural reaction, you know, it's, oh, well, you just, you just don't want competition or yeah. this is the way it's going to go. You need to just, you know, it's not our fault, you know? Yeah. Uh, how do you kind of talk to people about it without kind of insulting people or arguing with people and what actually does kind of resonate? with, with them in the way that you want? It's a, it's a good question. And when people bring up the competition point, I say it's it's not about Amazon being competition because I wish I could compete, but their yeah. market share is so big and their business practices are so ruthless and anti-competitive that it's impossible for it to compete in the book world. It's a monopoly. Um, Amazon has no competitors. The, I would love a playing field where I could actually be viewed as a feasible competitor to Amazon, at least in the book market. Um, so that's one thing. But I, I also think the, the shaming people for their, for their purchasing um, doesn't work. And to some extent, I think just simply listing Amazon's um, calamities also doesn't work. Um, yeah. the, the most resonant thing, and I think what I really try to focus on the most, and this informed a lot of my decisions in putting the book together, is focusing on the importance of small businesses and the power a small business has and the the relationships that these places have with their communities and like instead of what what amazon does let's talk about what small businesses do with the knowledge that if amazon continues its growth if amazon continues to get everything it wants these small businesses will no longer be here uh so um the 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 best distillation of this kind of argument is say i'm 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 gonna buy a new book um i see concrete rose by angie thomas right here if i decide to buy that from an independent bookstore instead of amazon it makes no difference to amazon 
Amazon is so big that that, that individual purchase is, is statistically insignificant, but it might be very significant to the bookstore in your town who might be having a bad day or a slow time. Um, that might make a huge difference. That might be the difference between meeting payroll and not for that bookstore um, or, or paying rent. Um, so it's a much bigger impact when you choose to shop local. It's in a way, it's a little bit less about resisting Amazon and a little bit more in, in supporting the small businesses that you have and making sure that they're still here um, for, for a strong future of community building. And you've got a lot of good feedback and kind of buy-in from local businesses uh, around your store, haven't you? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's one of the reasons I really love doing business in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, it's a college town. There are about 100,000 people here. Um, so it's a mid-sized city. Uh, but the, the best part of it is that we're that we've got a, a strong central core of independent businesses, of great um, independent restaurants and small retail, and, and we work together. Um, we all have, have different styles, um, but like there's a stationary store we're great friends with. We actually share a couple employees with the stationary store called Wonderfair, um, but their thing is local politics and they love to inform people about local politics and they'll uh, they, they host like bootleg live streams on their Instagram account for like uh, <laughs> DA, uh, you know, district attorney elections, uh, candidate forums. And they, they, they issue a voter's guide to take into the polls with you to make sure uh, you, that you're matching up with the progressive agenda when you're in the voting booth. And then there's uh, Lady Bird Diner across the street from us, um, who's another Lawrence business who's attracted national attention. But in the in the early days of the pandemic, of course, this kind of cramped and cozy diner had to shut down. Um, and they, they, res they don't do takeout at all in normal times. They're, they're really focused on the in-restaurant experience. And um, they, of course, had to shut down, but they had a kitchen and a pantry full of food. And so they just immediately turned it all into sack lunches that they handed out to whoever needed it. They said, free lunch at Lady Bird Diner, 11 o'clock tomorrow. And then that turned into the next day and the next day. And then they started getting donations. And all of a sudden they've turned into a food pantry where they're handing out 200 free lunches every day. And they've done it for a whole year, um, just scrapping together funding. Um, and uh, in terms of how businesses work together, um, I just love this story so much. So they, Meg, who's the owner of Lady Bird Diner, um, is looking for ways to fund her free meal program. Um, and so she's a great writer. She, she has amazing social media too. Um, and uh, she's like, I've got this, I've, I've been thinking about writing a book and I might just release it and self-publish it to um, raise money for the diner. And I'm like, okay, that's great, let's talk. And so I help her through that process. Uh, we get University Press of Kansas, which is our local publisher here to help her print the book and sell it to her at cost. And we start to sell it. Each paperback um, funds four meals. Um, and it's like, it's on the cusp of becoming our best-selling book of all time. Um, and, and she's still going, they're still handing out free meals. Um, so that's, I mean, that's community building. That's every, every part of that story is Lawrence, Kansas is a, is a collection of businesses that cares deeply about making sure, um, the people of Lawrence, Kansas are, are taken care of. I mean, that's a book that's written and produced and sold uh, locally. And nobody else sells that book, but it's the Ravens best-selling book of all time. And like, that's the kind of stuff uh, that people love. Um, it, it's a good book. It's a good cause. Um, it's a heartwarming story, uh, but it's also something that Amazon would never, ever, ever do. So I don't want to get into a big sort of, like you said, you don't want to just list all the things that Amazon <laughs> does wrong, but the thing that always, you know, upsets me the most is how Amazon treats its employees, you know, compared yeah. to how, you know, the community building and how yeah. places like your place uh, treats their employees. Can you talk a little bit about kind of why it's so important for us to fight back and why these unions that you mentioned are really important? Yeah, it, it is an important question. I think people, I don't think by any means you should ignore it. Um, and, and when I say, um, the, the arguments don't resonate about labor rights and, and worker safety. I wish they did more. Um, but people see, uh, you know, uh, a book that's 45% off that you can get shipped to your house the next day for free. And they, the, the sheer convenience of that, I think, can blind people to what it actually takes to make that happen. And what it takes to make that happen that quickly is absolutely crushing working conditions. Um, the statistic I return to over and over again is that injury rates at Amazon warehouses are twice industry average. 
meaning a warehouse worker at an Amazon plant is twice as likely to get injured at work as they are uh, at any other warehouse, um, which tells me that, that Amazon's kind of relentless tactics have a real cost for the people who work there. Um, and these are the people that provide the thing that people love that makes the money for Amazon and, and they're, they're in dangerous conditions. Um, the conditions are dangerous because of the pressure to work quickly. Um, and they're, they're placed under these, these crushing quotas called making rates um, that, that most people are physically incapable of keeping up with, which of course leads at some point to injury. Um, but the warehouses are hot. Uh, the bathrooms, the, the kind of the story people tell is that you have 15 minutes to, for a bathroom break, but the bathroom is 10 minutes away, mm -hmm. uh, which means you, even if you turn around when you hit the bathroom, that's still a 20 minute break. Um, and those five minutes over, you're dinged for, for not making rate. So you're forced to rush. And um, any, Amazon is um, not only creating these conditions um, that are dangerous to work in, but they are working very hard to prevent um, workers from advocating for better conditions. And the, the union busting efforts in Alabama are indicative of a bigger problem and that Amazon doesn't want its workers to have any power or say in, in what they're doing. Um, these, these tactics are so desperate. They're getting, Amazon workers in Alabama are getting like five to 10 robocalls a day uh, from Amazon, encouraging them to not vote yes on the union. And the, I think the, the best example of, of how crafty and, and desperate Amazon is, they changed the traffic light patterns outside the warehouse to make the red lights shorter uh, because union organizers were walking up to cars and handing out literature at the traffic uh -oh. lights. So Amazon called the city and was like, you need to make this red light shorter. Um, so they'll, they'll do anything to prevent these workers from advocating for better conditions. And I think the fact that they're this terrified of it is a perfectly clear example of why it's so important um, that they're providing a blueprint. And I think even if the vote isn't successful and they don't unionize, um, it is, people are watching. This is a, this is a national story. Um, other Amazon workers are watching um, and, and, and learning and hopefully taking cues from these, these courageous um, workers. And so it's really important to me um, to make clear that I, I hold no grudge against people who work for Amazon. In fact, I feel a tremendous amount of solidarity. They're book workers too. Um, much of what I'm doing in, in advocating for change and to educate people about Amazon is it, in a way for them because um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're in terrible conditions working a thankless job to enrich a giant company that's really desperate to take away power from them. Um, and I feel immense uh, respect and solidarity for them in that regard. I hadn't heard about that traffic light thing. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's my business to know all the things that they do terribly, but like, there's just so much stuff. And there was, <laughs> yeah. your book's got three or four things in there too that I didn't know that just kind of like made my, my jaw hit the floor. Um, so again, I love that it, you kind of compiled all this stuff for us. Uh, was there one thing in particular that was like the most surprising or the most upsetting, you know, when you were looking at this? Um. Well, I mean, there's there's so many stories. Um, there was there was one warehouse in Pennsylvania uh, that um, was hot. It wasn't air conditioned, um, and it, it was getting to be ninety five or hundred degrees um, Fahrenheit. Are you Celsius? You're Celsius. We're Canada. Celsius, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, hot, really, really hot, unsustainably hot. And like Amazon's decision before they put air conditioning in the warehouse was just to park an ambulance outside and wait for people to pass out of heat exhaustion. Um, or the um, Emily Gwendelsberger, who wrote a book called On the Clock, where she embedded for six months in an Amazon warehouse. It's a tremendously invaluable book. Um, and and it, it shaped a lot of what I wrote. And many other people have looked at her work as important. Um, but she made kind of made famous the idea of the Advil vending machines. Um, and they, uh, and it, rather than putting in medical clinics in their warehouses, Amazon is just putting vending machines filled with painkillers. And like that to me is, that's, I can't imagine that being the, my first answer to a question like that. It's like, why are employees, like, what can we do to take care of our employees and put a vending machine filled with Advil? Maybe instead, like, I can't imagine thinking that instead of like, let's fix the conditions that are causing people to feel pain. Right. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, there's just so much stuff 
um, that's that's eye opening. Um, there is another one um, that was two. This is from a book called Monopolized by David Dayan, which is another great book. Um, is two Amazon two two people who sell third party on the marketplace. So two small businesses who use Amazon for their fulfillment and, and selling their stuff. Um, they meet through kind of Amazon marketplace circles and get married and move in together. Um, and then Amazon notices that their accounts are using the same IP address and locks them both out of their businesses right. um, and shuts them down. Um, there's a perfectly clear explanation of why they were running their businesses from the same house, but Amazon just sees two accounts from the same IP address. And like once you're in the appeals process with Amazon, Amazon has their own government and, and kind of judicial system about the marketplace sellers and appeals. And it's, it's notoriously punitive. There's an entire industry of like lawyers who help take care of Amazon appeals. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, just all this stuff, it's, it's shocking, it's dystopian. Um, and it, it's not hard to find and it's out there. And, and I wish, um, I don't know, it's Amazon is so easy and, and so convenient and they're so good at, at kind of snagging people and, and hooking people on their services that um, this stuff uh, gets ignored. But I think it's more people are talking about it and I'm really encouraged uh, to see the, the volume and energy that's, that's coming to this conversation uh, and this issue. There's one other thing I wanted to, to bring up before we, we kind of see if there's questions from the people watching. Um, one of the things that I was kind of aware of, but your book kind of opened up even more. One of the things I don't get at all are people who want to give Amazon money to put a listening speaker mm -hmm. or a video doorbell in their house. Like I would get it to a point if it was free, you know, you get this neat thing and they'll get all your data and, and whatever, but how Amazon is using these kind of listening devices for nefarious purposes. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about kind of your fear of where that's going and what you've seen with that. Because you, yeah. you paint a pretty, a pretty dark picture. It's a good question. Um, and there, there, I think there are huge concerns about um, the video doorbells in particular. Um, with the Alexas, it's never clear who exactly is listening and when Alexa is listening or not. And there's a lot of evidence that it's collecting a lot more data than you would think. And um, they, uh, people, actual human people have access to your audio data, um, which is something that Amazon says isn't happening, but there's a lot of evidence that, that it is in fact true. Uh, but with the doorbells, so the Amazon um, has these, this company, uh, Prime Van just drove by out in front of the bookstore. Nice, they're, <laughs> I bet they're listening. Um, the, uh, the, the Ring doorbells, which Amazon owns that company, um, they uh, have these relationships with police departments um, where um, the police can, you can send video from your doorbell direct to the police. Um, and I, I think, I mean, the past year of it has made it abundantly clear that we need to be hugely uh, skeptical and critical of American policing, which has failed in, in many ways um, over the past couple of centuries, but especially over the last year. Um, and so, but like Amazon so values these partnerships that they, they um, customers buy the doorbells and send the video in, but they also turn police departments into effectively into salesmen for these ring videos. And they'll sign the police department up and they'll be like, okay, uh, sell these in your community or make sure your community is, is on board with these ring doorbells. So you've got, you've got cops out there that are basically selling surveillance devices that you attach to your home. Um, and then I think the, the very act of, of being safely ensconced in your house and sending video of someone to the police department without their consent or knowledge um, is immensely troubling. Um, and it's not, it's not hard to extrapolate um, you know, the, the racial uh, implications of something like that. Um, and again, now we're really veering into territory where, where police uh, have shown that they can't be trusted. But the, the really concerning thing for me is Amazon has this, this surveillance technology in one hand. And in the other hand, they're working very hard on facial recognition technology. Um, and, and they have a lucrative and, and, and uh, very valuable facial recognition technology called recognition with a K. Um, and they're being cagey about plans to ever combine the two. But um, just imagine 
Uh, they, they haven't denied, they, they do deny, on, on the one hand, the official PR is that we deny that we're ever going to bring facial recognition to, to ring doorbells. But then you have executives at these conferences that are like, we might be working on this. Right. Um, and you also really can't trust anything that Amazon says. Um, so just the mere fact that it's possible that the, one company holds these two technologies that would be so dangerous when combined uh, is, is frightening to me. And facial recognition is notoriously inaccurate with darker skin. And so yes. again, we're bringing in um, racism, technological racism and, and concerns about race and policing. And so like, uh, you know, someone's face is in a police database and it's like, if they ever walk in front of a ring doorbell, they get flagged by this facial recognition. But the facial recognition uh, gets it wrong because this person has dark skin and all of a sudden that person is in police custody. It's just, it's a, it's a powder keg. Uh, and I think it's it raises serious questions about um, privacy uh, and, and policing. But it's like people like to op pick up their phone and see who's at their door. Um, so they buy the ring doorbells. And, you know, um, I, I think we need to be really careful when we think about uh, who gets our data and what kind of companies get our data and um, how much we we trust those companies with that data. And Amazon has a record that they're not really trustworthy with the amount of data they collect. Um, so I, it, it is an issue that I'm, I'm concerned about. Uh, when, you know, when I'm out delivering books, it's, <laughs> it's, it's weird uh, to, to go to a house with a doorbell. Uh, it's like, I don't know, do I like, it, in a way it's like, I'm glad we're in an era where we wear masks in public <laughs> because right. like it, it foils the ring doorbells and the facial recognition just a little bit more. It's also just insane that your competition for books is also this company that's doing yeah. all this. It's not like you're to drive around and thinking, oh, if only I could drop things 20%. There's just all this nefarious stuff in the background. It's just absurd. Yeah, yeah. And your book does such a good job of kind of outlining it in like a really cohesive way that, that, that uh, I really appreciated. Thank you. Um, so I guess um, one last question. What's the one thing, if there's one thing that you want people to take away from, from this book when they, when they pick it up? I, just that if like if you value um, small businesses and community oriented um, spaces in, in your town, um, they're they're worthy of your support and, and care. Um, so it, it's it, as I said before, it's it's even less about resisting Amazon and more about nurturing the spaces that are nurturing your community. Um, and, and those spaces um, to a T are facing some kind of pressure from Amazon um, or some kind of pressure from big tech monopolies. If it's not retail and Amazon, it's restaurants and, and places like Grubhub or Uber Eats or these predatory apps um, that, that, that make it so hard for restaurants to make money. Um, so just making conscious choices to support and care for the community, the spaces that care for your community, um, is important work and I think it's worthwhile and it's it's a way to make sure that those spaces um, have a future in your in your community um, and, and they can kind of thrive uh, and continue doing that important community work. Love it. Oh, I'm just going to take a look. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, there's some from Molly. Um, you pointed out that the onus can't be on the consumer to make changes and things like this. That said, are there things we can do as individuals to put pressure on Amazon to change? That's a really good question. Uh, I love that question. Thanks, Molly. Um, I think it's important to think of this as a policy issue. Um, I've never talked to my representatives more than I have uh, in, in dealing with this book. I um, mean, it's turned me into an activist in ways I never thought I would be. Um, and it's, I, I'm organizing, I'm regularly communicating with my elected officials. Um, so uh, that's one thing is making sure people um, in positions of power are aware of these issues and aware of how you feel about it. Um, and that's, I mean, Amazon really is pretty responsive to bad PR. Um, so I think it's important to read about and share the information that makes these news articles about um, Amazon's violations of, of labor laws or anti-competitive laws. Um, the more the word gets out, they do feel the pressure. Um, so I think it's important to stay educated and share this stuff and, and make noise about it. Um, it it's one, you know, I've, I'm kind of, there is a public um, kind of a public 
perception campaign going on, especially in the States. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be part of it, um, but I think all this noise is gonna make a difference. Thanks for that question, Molly. We just got Sydney Haynes just saying she loves following you on Twitter and respects all the work you put in. Tries to spread the word. Amazon is detrimental to the book industry herself, but folks don't like to take young women seriously, which is unfortunately true. That's um, Sydney. I will say um, one of the one of the fascinating parts of Raven history is that um, it was founded by two young women. Um, Pat Katie and Mary Lou Wright, uh, who could not secure a bank loan to start their business um, because all of the banks they talked to, and there were many, told them it was a hobby and, and books and book selling was a hobby and not a viable business. Uh, and of course, like here I am with the profitable bookstore that they started 35 years later. So jokes on them, on the banks, but also like they just they scrapped it together. One of them took out a second mortgage. They they did some some kind of prehistoric crowdfunding from the community before there was anything like Kickstarter, um, and, and they made it happen. But we're we're well aware of of that problem. Uh, but I encourage you to keep making noise. Uh, Brittany asked a good question here that I had thought of asking too. Um, she just checked and noticed that your book is out of stock on Amazon.ca. What are your thoughts about Amazon selling your book and how did they get access to it? And this is something that you go into in detail in the book, but if you could uh, let her know what's going on. Yeah, there. well, I mean, they're, they're out of stock because they can't get it direct from Microcosm. And so since Microcosm won't sell directly to Amazon, they always have stock issues with Microcosm books because they have to get them through a third party place, probably a book wholesaler. Um, so, and, and that slows the process down. Um, it, it, people ask me this a lot and I'm largely fine with it. I would of course rather sell my books um, through independent bookstores um, for, for all of the reasons we've been discussing tonight. But at the same time, if I'm thinking about um, reaching an audience that might be able to, to learn something or perhaps change some behaviors or, or put that pressure on elected officials, um, I think it's okay to reach people on Amazon with anti-Amazon, you know, it's like some of these people might need to see this book and, and read it. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of cool with it. I'm upset that it might sell for less or make my publisher or me less money because it's on Amazon. Um, but um, I don't mind seeing it up there because, you know, maybe someone who needs to see it will see it there. It just goes to show how much Amazon will kind of sell anything as long as it makes a buck. Yeah. Like, if someone wrote a book that King's Bookstore is a turd, I probably would say no to that. Yeah. <laughs> They'll make a couple well, bucks on it. Let's see, you know, they're running into problems with that. Um, it, it's interesting. They, they used to call themselves the everything store, and they don't do that anymore. And they're one of the reasons why the anti-Amazon fight is bipartisan is because of free speech issues that get people on the right really riled up. Um, yeah. And so Amazon has decided um, they're these vile anti-trans books. I don't even know what it's called, um, but they've, they've decided, oh, it's books. They've decided not to sell books that treat um, queerness as a mental illness. Um, we're like, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a great decision. I mean, the, the Raven has made that decision. We're not gonna yeah. sell books that do violence to, to queer people. Of course not. We have queer people that work here. Um, but uh, that's a, a perfectly normal decision for a bookstore to make. And a, a bookstore, especially a small one, makes a thousand decisions like that every day. Um, there are millions of books I decide not to carry in my bookstore simply because of space. But I also make those decisions based on whether I think the books are harmful or, or bad um, or, or would bring violence to people I love. Um, but when Amazon has a monopoly, uh, then you get into interesting territory with free speech, right? Because if Amazon has 75% of online book sales and they decide not to sell a book, all of a sudden that looks a lot more like censorship than an inventory question. Right. Um, and so like, even though these are vile books and hateful books, I think there is a question of free speech when something as big as Amazon decides not to be the everything store. And they've had to face that pressure much more in, in recent years, um, whether it's, um, you know, through selling Nazi paraphernalia or, or these these horrible anti queer books, um, it's a question that Amazon is not prepared to deal with, and they're not dealing with it particularly well uh, because they, for so long, they were trying to be the everything store. Uh, Sydney Haynes is asking: Is there any locations that she can order signed copies of your book from, preferably with reasonable shipping prices for here in Nova Scotia? 
I think probably the easiest thing for me to do is just send some uh, signed book plates to our friends at King's Co-op because um, it'd be sh it's cheaper to send those than, um, than sending the book. So um, we'll talk and we'll figure it out. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Uh, any last questions from anybody? Danny and I have a strict Zoom events must be under an hour policy. So we're getting <laughs> close to it. So we'll, we'll start wrapping it up. Um, there's nothing else. Um, I just want to say thanks again for talking to us and like, making a Canadian stop officially for your book. Yeah, it's been really fun. I, I loved it. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. And the book again is How to Resist Amazon and Why from Microcosm uh, Publishing. And you can get it from kingsbookstore.ca uh, or get it on Amazon if you want, but hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, you thanks did, a lot, you, Danny. Pretty good. You should do more of these. Uh, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Okay. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks. Bye.